I was, I was, I really admired how many hours some of the superintendents spent on on instruction and curriculum to a to a pretty detailed level, and I, I more hours than I spent on it. Like I really pride myself in being an instructional, you know, learning leader, and and so I've really tried to be more more hands on engaged in that work that I understand it more at a more granular level than I did did previously, and so. I, I think that's something that came through because I like I go, oh, I guess, you know, I can't, you know, that where we, we've had that conversation about finding the time, I would often say, well, I don't have the time for that. Well, it's actually, no, I just haven't prioritized that. So maybe sure. I should try to prioritize that a little more. When I started this podcast, thinking about how I would celebrate and share the, you know, the great Canadian leaders that we have, my mind immediately went to British Columbia and all of the great superintendents and principals and teachers and just uh, outstanding leaders. Uh, and yet, it took me ten episodes to get there, but I'm I got there, and I, there's more to come for sure. But um, I'm excited to talk with my good friend, Chris Kennedy, specifically about his dissertation around how principals spend their time. Uh, what, just a great conversation that, that I had. Chris has already blogged eight different times about different aspects of that research that he did, each one of them kind of fascinating on their own, everything from so, some, so how it differs from gender to gender, size to size, what people define as urgent. And uh, as Chris describes, you know, uh, superintendents is, is a pretty lonely position in that you're the only one and there's nobody else in your, in your district that you can uh, talk with. And so uh, British Columbia, to that end, has a quite, I think, quite a uh, powerful community of superintendents that regularly uh, connect and talk. Uh, so I think there's there's something to be said about that. But uh, he his research looks at 60 different superintendents and the work they did. And our conversation uh, explores a lot of that aspect and some other fun personal stuff that we share in this conversation as well. And as always, uh, this podcast is brought to you by ALP, Advanced Learning Partnerships, where I serve and along with my colleagues, communities across Canada and the U.S., uh, so uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to learn from leaders and also highlight the great work that they're doing across Canada. You can be great if you did that. Hit that subscribe button and like button. What I, I don't know if there's a like button. I say that. I don't know. There, there is, I guess, on YouTube, I suppose. Uh, hit it. It, it. Like It does help. I don't completely understand all the metrics around that. But it, it's nice to know that people are finding these conversations uh, useful and I'm certainly grateful for the time that these wonderful people take, and I'm very, very proud of the 10 episodes that I've done so far with just great leaders across the country, and for the very first time, introducing you to some of the great leaders in the province of British Columbia and my conversation with Chris Kennedy. I was thinking about the first time we connected. Do you remember when that was? This is one of those moments where I should know what it was because it meant something. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the answer. To me. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I don't know the answer. I just thought, well, maybe you knew. Uh, the first time I saw you present was on, there used to be these um, online, like the something online conference, like two days of- uh, K-12, K-12 online conference? K-12 online uh, conference, was, like that? Where there 2009, was- 2009, I think. Yeah, something like that where people would present at. Uh, maybe even a touch earlier than that. Maybe not. Maybe, but I mean, I think we both connected through blogging because you and I were right. One of the f one of that st handful still like it, it, it kind of grew a little bit, and now it's sort of back down to like there's just like a handful of people that still are. I mean, you're better than I am about it for sure. But it, it's going to come back. It's like vinyl. Jeez. We'll be back. I hope. I hope. I hope. Who else? Like, uh, yeah. So, so while we're on that conversation, so so tell me about any other superintendents that that are that you think are are pretty steady of blogging and and doing a good job of it. Who's still oh, doing it? 
Dave's Dave, everyone. Dave, everyone's really good. He's he blogs right. a couple of times a month. His stuff's really. I, I I really think he's good. He's he's more provocative than I am, so uh, I give him credit for that. He's good. Yeah, but he, doesn't uh, have a, he doesn't have an April April first uh, no. series though. <laughs> <laughs> you know me. I like a streak. I just got streaks going all over the place. Yeah, that's right. Um, Who else? Like in BC. Like in terms of being a regular blogger, I don't think there's anybody else out here. In Canada, are there any other superintendent blog, regular superintendent bloggers? No, no. I mean, back in the day, John Malloy used to blog once in a while. Like, I bet, you know, it, it just didn't. Like just Kevin Godden something. used to be good at it. Uh, Jordan yeah. Kinney was often would blog. Um, back in the day, Steve I mean, Cardwell it, would blog. I mean, I think now when it comes down to it, I mean, it, you know, when you, and this is, we'll get into why I wanted to talk to you is like, just like people would probably debate amongst themselves. Well, when do I have time for that? Like I already got enough stuff to do. So when you think about that question saying like, gee whiz, you're a busy guy as superintendent. Like, how can you make, how can you carve out the time to blog and why would you? Yeah, but I, that's like everything. Isn't it one of those, if it's important, you find time? Like every, like you're good at that too. Like I think the art of the superintendency, like getting to our conversation is, is you is you're, you are you never appear too busy for important things if it's important to you, right? Like like part of the is, is part of the thing is I find in the job is I don't ever want to uh, come across as, as overly busy. Like, like I always, I want to, so that I'm always in a mindset where I have, can make time for people and things right. and ideas and like, and so like, yeah, we all got stuff, but like, sure. I don't know, blogging is important, is like, people have time, it's just, they haven't decided it's important to them. Like, but why is it important to you though? Yeah. So I, I guess I, it is one, I guess one is it's part of, it's become my signature a little bit. Like, so you define yourself in a role and so. People have come, like it's built a community for me. People come to and have have told me they enjoy it, so I I like that. Um, I like still the idea of thinking of ideas, and so um, you know that podcast you and I both listened to with uh, Adam Grant and Pete Carroll. There was an um, there was a there, I'm I'm taking an idea out of there, and I just I I I I I stopped in the middle of listening to the podcast and wrote this idea down. I'm going to talk about how teaching is how the act of teaching is like being a, a, a rock star in the idea that people often just want you to play the greatest hits. And like, it's interesting, some aging rock stars just play the greatest hits while others are continually like making new music or rethinking their music. And like, I, I you know, isn't, is, is teaching somehow like that too? Like how sometimes you just do the best lessons over and over and some teachers just do it over and over and they go, Hey, do the, you know, do the February field trip again. But others are always like, ah, that was good. But like, I want to, I want to create new stuff. And like, um, I can't even remember. I, I just got that. I, I was thinking about that, listening to the, it's a Pete Carroll talk about his, the, that notion of reinvention that he was talking about with himself. And so like, I just, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm put, I just, I wrote down some notes and I'll write it up. I'll put, try to flesh it out this weekend and it might be good. It might be bad, but I want to put it out there and like, and like just for, it will be a conversation like, Oh, like it's, I just have an idea around that, but I'd love to flesh it out. You know, I listened to Roger Daltrey say about the who it got me thinking too recently. He said, he goes, we're not make right. We're not going to make any more new music. Nobody, the, nobody wants to hear us play new music. They just want us to play the greatest hits all the time. Well, I, I contrast that with, now I'm off on a tangent, with like, so Paul Simon and Cat Stevens both have new albums coming out next month. And like, they're two of my favorites. But like, they will, they, they, they see the work as like continuing to be creative. And that's what I think Pete Carroll's like. And then I think, well, isn't that what, isn't that what we want teaching? And like, I think about my work as superintendent too. Like, like I, I don't, I don't want to be the who. I want to be Paul Simon. Well, yeah, and I that's, think that's going to be a blog I, post. That, yeah, so no, that's an idea. One. That's yeah. an idea that I got from listening to a podcast and go like, rather than that, just living in my head, I want, I right. gotta, I gotta write it down because that makes me process it. And then I put it out to the world because other people will have some thoughts on it and go, that was like, that didn't make any sense or whatever. And I don't, 
I, I'm comfortable enough that I'm okay if people don't agree or don't whatever. Well, like, whatever. And you already wrote a post about be you know giving permission to be a bad writer like you yes. you get to do yeah. that and I, I but i think the difference is there like when i think about okay who are the artists that i would love for like i love anything they do i'm going to be like curious and interested to see or listen to or watch or whatever medium we're talking about and then the ones that like i just play the ones i know I, it had to me the difference is like like a Paul Simon, you're very invested in his music. Like there's a community, you've been to a billion of his concerts. So yeah. you, you put a lot of trust in, in him. Whereas maybe I'm not saying this is, this is what you feel about the who, but like people that you, I mean, like I know who they are, but like, I don't have time to learn all your new stuff. So just play the stuff I'm really comfortable with. Like, like I like that. I don't want to like, Oh, what are you trying to do? Cause I don't get like, if I don't understand them as an artist, I'm not going to get what they're trying to do. Whereas when you follow somebody and again, back to the Pete Carroll thing, like he's got, he's got followers, he's got a community that's like, if he's got a new idea, yeah, let's go with it. Now that doesn't say everybody's going to at the end of it, say, Oh, that was the greatest thing. They might say, ah, it wasn't that great, but you don't, you give people, you give people grace and you want to go along for the ride with them because you're part of that community. I think that's a big part of it too. Yeah. Um, well, why do you, why do you block? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, it is because like, I think like, is this a thing? Like it, I get an idea in my head and I go like, is this a thing? Like, is this just in my head? Like, am I the only one that thinks this? And so part of it, I think one of it is just to flesh out my idea, right? To get it on paper so that I, I can look at it and go like, oh, okay, yeah, that's what I meant. Does that do other people see this? And oftentimes when I'm writing, like, you know, you put the disclaimer at the beginning, like, I don't know if this is going to make any sense, but I'm going to roll with right. it anyway. And then people join you and say, like, yeah, no, no, this makes sense. Or I think what you're trying to say is this, or here's another way that, that I'm thinking about this. So sometimes it's that, that community effort, right? Like it is a little bit of a collaborative um, experience, but other times it's like, no, I think this is, I think this is important. And I mean, I have in the past for sure. I don't think you've done this <laughs> to the degree that I have. Uh, there's probably a word for it, but basically rant blogged. Like, like I was just upset about something, right? Like something yeah, bugged yeah. me and I just want to get it out. I mean, now people do that with Twitter or whatever. I'm trying not to do that as much anymore, but that, sometimes that's a, just a valuable thing too. Like I just want to vent and say like, this, this bugs me. I don't like the way this, this is coming down. And so I, I've done all kinds of that, but let's, let's talk about, so, so first of all, like this is the first of, I've, this is my 10th podcast and of the 10, this is the first person from British Columbia, which is strange because uh, I do probably most of my work in Canada in British Columbia. I have most of, you know, such a, uh, a great community of people that I admire, but it just didn't didn't land. But but why I wanted to uh, invite you on, not just because of, of who you are as a superintendent, but as a leader, your dissertation was all about the way in which superintendents uh superintendents use their time so just uh give a little bit of context to uh, why why that one and and uh just the experience of, of putting that all together yeah so i i've right from when i became a superintendent got appointed in 2009 i've been always interested in how other people do the job because it's it's very unique you're the only one in your district and so i would all always ask colleagues you know how do you spend your time how much like what are you doing? Because it, it, it really felt like right off the bat, like you could do it really, really differently. And I saw, you know, I had seen examples of the superintendent who I followed or in a different district where I had been a principal or a teacher. And I kind of had a sense of what they did and everyone was a little bit different. Um, and so that like, I guess I'd always been curious about that question. Like, so, so what do you do all day? Like the same, the question that, you know, I could explain to my kids really well what I did as a teacher. I could explain to them pretty well what I did as a principal, but it was really hard for me to explain to my kids, like, dad, what did you do at work today? And like, uh, well, I don't know. I, I worked. And like, <laughs> and so, so that was a bit of the, like, you know, even for myself to begin to categorize how I spent my time. Cause I've always been one to believe that you, you know, where you spend your time matters in leadership because people notice. And so I was curious about that. And then, you know, what I thought would be, well, wouldn't it be interesting to go and look at, there's 60 school districts in BC, different sizes, you know, what role does gender play? What role does student population play? What role does urbanization play? 
what role does you know your life experience or your it play in terms as a superintendent in terms of how you spend your time and try to just unpack all of that and go okay so what's the bc story how does it relate to mine and you know are there lessons here you know and for what i learned through the process was we churn through a lot of people into this position so are there lessons here that we might be helpful knowing that every five years over 60 or 70 percent of the population of superintendents will be different and like maybe we could do a better job about telling them what the job could be or exposing them to thinking about the job differently so uh you you know it made sense to do this with bc principles and i like do you since that time i mean that was your study have you had any conversations or um uh, revelations about how the bc experience is different from other parts of the world or is it like that's just that's the obviously where you choose chose to focus your your research around and but but i just i'm just curious to know if, if you were able to think oh yeah since then i've learned that yeah the way bc principals do, or superintendents do it is different from ontario or illinois or wherever other part of the world it, 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 yeah it does seem so i've shared a bit of this with some american colleagues it does seem that um the job feels less political in canada than it does in the united states so it seems as though um, and this is more other U.S. superintendent stories are anecdotal, not statistical, that they say they are spending more time like with bond initiatives or on on working with um, working with local government around curriculum decisions, because w those things like in B.C. are like the province decides the curriculum, you know, that there is a that that they have. There, that that there is localized differences which create which in in the many U.S. places which I think leads to them being more stuck into politics, and I would think I, I, what I found is I think the B.C. superintendents saw themselves more as the learning leaders than many of the their U.S. colleagues do for sure. And is that would you say that's that's true across Canada? Then how do you compare yourself to other? Canadian provinces, or is there way more more similarities than there would be differences? Yeah, so I, I, I'm cautious about comparing the, I guess where I know best is Ontario, but Ontario has has larger boards. And so I don't know if that's a good comparison because what my, what the, what my, my dissertation showed was, you know, basically the smaller the board, the more involved in learning you are. You know, kind of as, you, as your board gets bigger, you become more, you become less, less connected to that work. And so, you know, does it make sense that boards like Toronto and Hamilton and Peel, you know, are, are they are they less connected from learning than Abbotsford and Surrey and Vancouver because there's something unique about BC or is it just they're right. just that much bigger, you know, and yeah. like when you get that much bigger, it's just harder to do um, to to be, uh, you know, closer to the, the classroom. So you did you did uh, eight blog posts kind of just sharing some of your your learning from it of those eight was there one that um like you did talk about impact of student population kind of referenced that just now but uh was there any that like kind of stand out to you playing like that was that surprised me like i i kind of came in with this thought and i was i was a little surprised by what i found you know the one that came the one that i think surprised other people the most was just around thinking about the gender in superintendency. And so what 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 the study showed around the gender was first of all the demographics of the position. And so, you know, in BC about 75% of teachers are female, about um 60% of administrators are female, but like a third of superintendents are female. And so well, you know, why is that? Like it opens up that question. Uh, and then interestingly, um so uh, female superintendents tend to be more engaged in learning um, than male superintendents and also tend to spend more time with their board than male superintendents. And so those are just, um, you know, it's, those are just both interesting findings um, that, 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 you know, there, there seemed to be something about the gender about in BC's example, the gender of superintendents in terms of how they did their work was something that uh, like, I, I think was, you know, other people have picked up on that and find that really interesting. And yeah, I, I think that's, 
I think that's kind of curious to follow up on too. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, I mean, I, I, I suppose, I suppose you could, you could make all kinds of, um, guesses as to why that might be, but just the fact that it is, I think is an interesting conversation. So I, I wonder about, um, and I think, Again, as be- because I have I hold British Columbia in such high regard in terms of its uh, of, of education, I see and I know you know a number of superintendents, all of whom I respect you know quite a bit, and some who've even retired since then. Um, I've had conversations with people lately around the challenges that they've had um, hiring principals, like the the role of principals become a little bit. Um, more difficult to find people who want to take that leadership. So now you're jumping from, you know, that classroom level to, to a, a different level of leadership. But then when you get up to the superintendent's role, like there's, that can take a number of different uh, pathways to get there. Do you, I mean, I, I guess I'm just asking about sort of the state of, of, of senior administrative leadership in general. Um, and again, we're just, as we're talking here, uh, your, your associate and, and friend of mine, Sean is, is now a new superintendent in Abbotsford. Yeah. So he's obviously, obviously excited and interested in continuing that journey. But like, I, I guess I'm wondering, like, is there some sort of a gap in perceptions of leadership along that journey from principals to superintendents where the, the, the central office position, assistant superintendent, so forth. Uh, view that role differently than than might a principal. I'm I'm not phrasing this question very well, so hopefully you can kind of extrapolate what I mean. But I, I I just wonder if there's a different lens, an attitude about leadership at different levels within schools. So so a couple things came through in the, in the in the data. One was um, the boards matter in terms of senior leadership roles, and that and the boards that were seen to micromanage or to um, you know, to not give autonomy to superintendents. Superintendents found that frustrating and limiting and really decline, you know, lower job satisfaction for sure. And so I think, I think that, um, I think that districts that are having trouble finding good candidates for district level jobs, I think, I think uh, boards need to reflect on themselves and how they're seen. Because um, if they're, if they're seen to be meddling in the operations all the time, that's not going to attract um, that's not going to attract people to the work. Um, and, and, and the other part that I would highlight is, is that it was interesting that, that superintendents, a lot of this was during COVID, uh, the surveys that were done. Some saw they were, they, that some saw they had absolutely no control over their time. And some viewed like similar situations and go, oh, no, I got complete control over how I spend my time. That I, you know, I, I think maybe the superintendency draws some people who actually love to live in the urgent and the, and they're always loving the busyness of it. And they just, and they, they're always frantic and going, oh, so, you know, they, they're always busy, but they can never tell you what they're doing kind of people. Um, and, and so like, and, the, and, and while there's some other folks in that role who I think um, I have more joy in the work is, is that they saw, they saw COVID, like they saw the opera, they just kept seeing opportunities in it and the yeah, others work, but like, well, this allows me to be at work some remotely. This allows us to do some things online that we used to do in person. Like, like they almost looked at the same situations, just like polar opposites. And so I think it's interesting the kinds of people and, it, and the superintendency has, for whatever reason, draws both extremes to the work. And I, and I think of my colleagues in BC and I can think of, you know, I, I, I think I'm on the one extreme that I'm kind of, I always see opportunities. And I think of, you know, I think of some of my colleagues who, you know, like Sean, who's about to go to Abbotsford and like Kevin Godden, who was there before and and Jordan Tinney, who used to be in Surrey, when we all kind of, I think, always saw opportunities um, and never and, and never were frantic about the busyness of work. I don't yeah, know. Does that, I, I does mean, that get those, to the question? Those people, yeah, I mean, those those are the people that I, I think of, too, in terms of the way they exude that kind of calmness. And it's like just things will be fine. Right. And, and there's something about a leader that gives you that vibe that makes you think like, okay, I can, cause there's no doubt about it that it's very, very easy 
you know, whether it's a classroom, a school or district to fall into like, things are crazy right now. It's never been so wild. Like you hear, I mean, I, I talk right. to people every day and that's what they tell. Like, it's like, I've heard this story every day and, and I don't, I don't demean it. I don't demean no. it. It's true. I mean, that's what, that's what school is. Like, if, like, like there's no way that you're going to eliminate that frantic pace because you're dealing with children. <laughs> like that's well, I, who they are. I, you know, I, I think they're going to give you that. Yeah, like 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 teaching's always been hard. It will be and it's not going to be less difficult. It will be different difficult, right? Like and superintendency, like it's not like it's going to be less complicated. Like the complication, the the complexity will change over time, but like oh my god, now we have to do early learning and we got to do food programs and we had covid and I can't believe it and I can't deal with this anymore. Well, like those are all like I feel those are a lot of of what you bring to it. And I think you got to be careful in the superintendency because others pick up on that right away. And if you're anxious, then, then, you know, just like, you know, an anxious teacher makes for anxious students and anxious, Mm -hmm. an anxious superintendent makes for anxious principals and anxious teachers and anxious parents. Right. Right. Have you been able to, and again, I know this maybe wasn't part of your uh, research, but, but to what degree, you know, can you actually track, that kind of pathway down to, oh yeah, okay. These, you know, when, when this is the, the sort of the vibe that that superintendent gives off, here's how that's impacting the central office, how it's impacting principals. Like, I mean, I I think we always want it to be sort of a smooth path. There's gaps certainly between, there's always exceptions in there, but um, like when you were looking at this stuff, were you able to sort of nod your head and say, oh yeah, this makes sense. Cause I know, you know, principals at this, at this district or schools. I mean, you'd have to have a lot of data to parse that out. But. Yeah. But you know, like I, I would say I have a perception about districts in terms of their um, innovation combined kind of with a calmness to like, you know, that like I have a, like I have a sense of the vibe of the district and it was, and the data the superintendent provide really just affirmed that like, it wasn't as though a superintendent said, I'm crazy busy. It's never been more difficult. The board's all over me. This is the word. I wish I hadn't taken the job. While when I look from the outside, I go, oh, that's an innovative district. They're really moving. Like there was no, there wasn't that kind of a thing. There was a connection. Like the districts that I perceive to be the ones I, I admire and, and try to, to be more like, they're the data from the superintendents backed up the idea of, Hey, this is, you know, it's interesting, exciting work. We're doing, you know, it, it's always challenging, but like, you know, it is a bit of a glass half full, glass half empty. And like the gla- the superintendents with the glass half full were aligned to the districts that I've always thought, huh, they're doing some pretty cool things. Um, what's sort of the average length of a, of a BC superintendent in terms of being in the role? Is there yeah, an yeah, there? yeah. So, um, there was 63, 63% were within the first five years of the role when I did the survey. So, um, you know, almost, almost two thirds were, had less than five years experience, which I think is, I think is a, is a stunning number. Um, you know, it, it, you know, it speaks to a few things. One is, um, you know, a lot of people get these roles late in career and they right. retire out of them. And that's why that happens. You know, I, I don't think it's not the, you know, the U.S. phenomena, especially in some large urban districts, is they is they churn through them. They, you know, they they make it through one a board cycle and then the board comes in and brings a new superintendent in. So I don't think it's it's that as much. I I think, um you know, I, I think in the day, you know, superintendent said it was a it was an all consuming job. And so. I, you know, for, I think for some that, you know, how long can you, how long do I want to do this job that is just all every, it's just all consuming. And so that, that was, that, that came through as, as well. Yeah. Yeah. It is definitely a, a more of a you know, difficult position to, you know, say, well, Hey, this person's only, you know, the average turnover is every five years, but yeah, when you're, when you're getting the position in year 26 of your career, Right. <laughs> You're not going to, you know, that's enough. Right. I, mean, I, I, you know, I think people are, are, uh, maybe retiring earlier now than these. I don't, I don't know. How many I, and when you look anecdotally, that. if you, you know, I think if you and I think of the folks, some of the folks we know, so many superintendents, it's actually not their last job, right? They go on to do right. other kinds of work. Sure. And I think more so than teachers and other jobs. And I think that's a little bit because, um, you know, I think there is a shelf life, 
for many superintendents is how long do I want to do the work? And it's a bit like I think I think sports coaches. I think it's rare that you you know you have to think you have to be strategic if you're going to be in some place. You know, I, I think like I've been here, you know, as superintendent for like 13 years, like I got to find other ways to reinvent the organization because a, the most common way a lot of districts do it is by bringing in a new head coach. Right. Sure. Yeah. No question. Anything like uh, before we kind of wrap up here, was there anything else from this experience that, you know, you think is important for people to understand or share? You think that that really kind of um, made this a, a fulfilling effort on your part? Uh, I, you know, what I enjoyed the most was like how interested my BC colleagues have been in how what other BC, what other BC superintendents did. What I found out was actually everybody has been thinking the same questions I've been thinking. They hadn't you know, necessarily verbalized it or, or articulated it. But like everybody kind of wonders, like, so what do you do all day? Like, are you like meeting with the trustees? Like people were so interested in how many hours a week do you meet with your trustees? Because right. because. The super one of the superintendents from the very largest districts said they met five hours or less with trustees a week, and and the other group other superintendents in that group all said they met 21 hours or more with their trustees every week. So you know the what <laughs> is that waiting. what what's what's happening and and you know even in you know at any of those different size cutoffs, people were really interested, especially in the governance and how many how in that because. You know, what comments that came through were like every minute a superintendent spends with their trustees is one less minute they spend like system focused. Because if you're you're your governance focused or you're focused on the on the on the other work, you have those sort of dual right. jobs. And so you can meet with the trustees 30 hours a week, but no. But trustees and others need to know that doesn't that leaves very few hours for you actually to do the other work. Uh, of the superintendency that everybody says is really important. And so I, I think that question um, and then just and other superintendents and then, you know, the ask I've, I've gotten and I'm going to is I'll probably give it two more years and I, I you know, I won't get another doctorate for it, but I'm, I'm super interested in doing the, the research again and going, OK, like, you know, post COVID, how has that shifted? You know, is, is are, are we thinking differently about time now after we're through that sort of COVID phase? So is there anything, one more question then. So is there anything from the research that that you personally, uh, ha has impacted your your time personally says, oh, I've spent, I spent too much time on this or not enough time on that, or I need to rethink the way I do this. Was there anything that, that you've personally had to redo, rethink? So I, I was, I was, I really admired how many hours some of the superintendents spent on, on instruction and curriculum to a, to a pretty detailed level. And. I, I more hours than I spend on it. Like I really pride myself in being an instructional, you know, learning leader. And, and so I've really tried to be more, more hands-on engaged in that work that I understand it more at a more granular level than I did, did previously. And so I, I think that's something that came through because I, like I go, I guess, you know, I can't, you know, that where we, we've had that conversation about finding the time, I would often say, well, I don't have the time for that. Well, it's actually, no, I just haven't prioritized that. So maybe I sure. should try to prioritize that a little more. Well, uh, I think, you know, that, that idea of community and knowing what other people are doing, I think that's, that is sort of a theme throughout education. Cause even classroom teachers are really curious about how other classroom teachers in their position yeah. spend their time and how principals in other buildings spend their time. And so, because these, the, it's just, a, it is just a, a rather, um, unique profession in terms of how much time we do spend on our own in isolation, given the vast number of people in the organization. Like it's, 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 that's just a really challenging, challenging aspect of the, of the profession. And, and, and I think, I think, you know, another, sorry to keep going. One other thought that came through is we actually have more uh, autonomy than we sometimes think in all those roles, you know, that we go, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can't do this in my classroom because, you know, the curriculum says blank, or I can't do this in the school because the district says blank, or I can't do this as superintendent because, you know, the board says blank. I, I think we use that sometimes as an excuse not to jump and do the work. And that came through a little, I, I saw that in the data with superintendents. Again, some people, some people saw opportunities where some saw, um, you know, barriers in the, for exactly the same set of circumstances. Hmm. All right. Well, 
uh, I think we could keep talking. We may have to do a part two on this because there's lots here to talk, but we should wrap up. And I want to wrap up with uh, what are you reading or listening to lately? Uh, so uh, big into the podcast, um, uh, really enjoying uh, Adam Grant uh, on, on rethinking. I like that one. I like good sports. It's also through the TED Audio Collective, which is a is it has a different um, some different thinking around sports. And then more in the, you know, the one I, 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 another one I listen to every week is just Freakonomics, the Freakonomics podcast, because I really enjoy that one as well. Solid. Uh, what are you watching? Uh, I am, uh, I'm, watch, uh, I'm watching NBA playoffs right now. That's what I'm watching. Sacramento <laughs> oh, Kings. Awesome. Okay. Light All the right. beam. Yeah. Yeah, no, see, I, and that's just it. Like I, I did, I did pretty, like I got into the NBA course from the Raptors, you know, I, I was all bandwagon and I, I stuck with them even through like last year I watched them and it's like, you guys aren't worth, I can't watch you anymore. And so and now, and now like I watch hockey, like I didn't watch nearly as much hockey as I, as I am right now. So, so that's made. So I, I yeah, I couldn't even tell you who's really still kicking and screaming in the NBA, but, uh, uh, yeah, keep going. It's kind of a way you got a lot of stuff going on the West Coast there. You got Sacramento and Phoenix and are the Clippers still in it? Uh, Clippers just lost to the Phoenix Suns. Oh, they, they got kicked out by the Suns. You guys, so. you guys out East don't know what happens out West because you're always asleep when our games happen. Because we <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, all right. Last question. And I might even know the answer. I don't know if I know the answers. First of all, you don't like. Uh, like I always think Vancouver and I know you don't live in Vancouver. You live in Steveson. I think I got Steveston. that. Right. Steveston. I don't know. I mean, I've been there enough times. I don't know how to pronounce the stupid name, but uh, I'm always looking for, okay. So somebody's coming, let's just say broadly coming to visit the area. Like what's kind of a, uh, a lesser known, like you wouldn't find it if you Googled things to do in Steveson or things to do in Vancouver. Like what's something you'd say like, yeah, if you're coming for a weekend, you should check this out. This is kind of a really underrated, uh, under the radar kind of uh, experience or activity or whatever that that's not that most people wouldn't know or think about. I, I don't know. I, you know, it, it has a fair bit of cachet. But if you're if you're into hiking, I tell everybody to do the grouse grind. It's a it's it's a it's 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 a hard it's a hard hike. It's like an, it'll take you between just under an hour and an hour and twenty minutes. But it's you get to the top of Grouse Mountain, you get the most amazing view of the city. And it's you have this great sense of accomplishment when you're done. Okay, I, I haven't done that one, so maybe next time you'll we'll do you'll take me on it. We'll do the we'll gross grind one together. All right, perfect. Thanks for your time. This is awesome. Okay, thanks, Dean.